We're going to put our statement of faith up on the screen for you all to see. It's one of the things we have been working on since the fall when we went to the pastor's conference in uh, North Carolina. Some suggestions were made about things that we needed to have in our constitution. And as we started working on those things, we realized that we needed a statement of faith to point us towards the direction of life itself being a gift of God. So that's one of the reasons behind this statement of faith. So I'm going to read it now for you. And then today's message, we're going to break down this statement of faith a little bit and tell you why it's worded as it is, all right? Section 4 under uh, the area of man. We already have a section 4 in the Constitution or in our statement of faith, but we're going to change paragraph B to this here. We believe that God created man, male and female, in his own image for his own purposes and declared his unfallen image bearers to be very good. We affirm that life itself is a gift from God. We affirm that both genders as individually formed by God have distinct and meaningful purposes. We affirm that God calls us to treat all respectfully regardless of age, gender, ethnic, economic, or cultural characteristics. And then you see the scriptures that we base this on. This is not based on our thoughts or opinions It's based on the truth that we see in Scripture. So that's the reason we're introducing this statement of faith in our Constitution. Actually fits kind of nicely within the framework of the study that we have been doing in Philippians. Paul in this section has been warning about the false teachers and he's wrapping up his warning And in the wrap-up, he's directed the believer's attention and gaze to match his gaze. His gaze is upward. It's focused on God. It's above anything that we can focus on this earth. He's going to be moving next into this uh, next thought of this section. (coughs) Pardon me. And directing us to where the false teacher's gaze is. In this next section, we're going to see that those false teachers and those who are not following Christ's, their gaze is narrowly fixed on the earth. It's narrowly fixed on their own desires, their own interests. And that's why Paul is directing us to fix our gaze. This is not a new thing. It's not just the Philippians that Paul warned about this. He warned the Romans also to fix their gaze not on themselves. Don't fix their gaze on their surroundings. And he describes those who have progressively rejected God and made themselves to be the highest form of thinking and therefore began to worship themselves. We're made aware at the conference that this was necessary for us to discuss and put into writing as a protection for you all. And then as we got working on this, we were starting on our anti-abuse policies, our church polity, and our membership policies, and we came to the realization we didn't really have a section within the statement of faith that pointed to our belief that life is a gift from God. And we needed to word that this way. You notice I said we work on an anti-abuse policy because we started it as an abuse policy. And I thought we probably shouldn't have a policy for abuse, right? We're, We're against it, not for it. So that's how we worded that. This also kind of fits with my desire to keep you updated on my hearing progress. And this seems like it's got three parts to it, but it actually all fits together. I want to tell you just a little bit about what I have learned regarding my cochlear implant and the hearing miracle that we have. I'm going to show you a picture first of all. I've got a cross section of the human ear. Hopefully nobody's queasy here. I had a couple other ones that probably would have made you queasy, but I want to be able to show you some 
insight and information maybe you don't have. Anna probably has studied this better than the rest of us. Due to my sudden and profound hearing loss, I did some studying. That tends to happen, right? When something strikes you or something hits you hard, then it's like, I'm going to find out what this is all about. So I did some studying of hearing. I looked at the anatomy of our ear. God raised my attention. (laughs) He raised my interest in this area when he allowed me to become completely deaf in my right ear in one day. This was not a progressive hearing loss that happens to many of us as we age and are exposed to the sounds that we hear. I want you to understand I'm not an anatomy teacher. I'm not here to point out the different things and tell you what all of it works together. I just want to tell you what I learned. I want to tell you what I found to be absolutely fascinating about the ear, just the ear. You can study any part of human anatomy and be just as fascinated by it as I was with this. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the ear and how we hear. In this diagram, if you take a look on the far side, it's almost cut off because we know what an ear looks like. We can see those things all the time, right? They're pretty obvious to us, but that's the breakdown of what we have here. The outer ear, then the ear canal is what you see most of right there. The eardrum, or which is also called the tympanic membrane. If you're in medical circles, you'll want to know that and impress some people. Behind that are the tiny bones of the inner ear. Anybody remember what those are called? Okay, tiny bones of the inner ear, right? In the diagram of the ear, you can see all of the parts that we were taught in school and how they function together. The tiny bones of the inner ear, that stapes, it's hard to see in this, but it's touching a tiny little window of the cochlea. That's called the, what is that called? Oh, I guess I didn't write that down. The vestibular apparatus. Isn't that interesting? The vestibular apparatus is what that's called. And then finally, the cochlea. That's that thing that looks like a snail wrapped around itself. That's the actual cochlea. All by itself, these things are pretty amazing, I would say. But when you start actually digging in to what they do and how these tiny organs all work together to transmit sound into our brains... It's incredible. The outer ear captures and directs sound waves. You guys all understand sound is a wave, right? And it travels into our ear through our ear canal after our ear itself directs it that way. That ear canal focuses the waves and it causes the eardrum or the tympanic membrane to vibrate. Behind that tympanic membrane, there's fluid. The vibrations in the fluid are translated through the bony structures, those three tiny bones that break down the energy from the sound pressure vibrations and turns it into waves that travel through that fluid to the inner ear. The little stapes bone presses on the oval window of the cochlea, And this area is one-eighteenth of the size of the eardrum. Anybody ever stuck a a cotton swab in your ear? You know how tiny your eardrum is. Now take one-eighteenth of that. That's that little window that the stapes bone vibrates when there's sound. That reduction actually increases the sound pressures in the fluid that's inside the cochlea. The cochlea is that snail device wrapped around itself. Now we're going to put up a cross section of the cochlea all by itself, that thing that's wound around like a snail. Inside of this organ, there are thousands of microscopic hairs that sense the movement in the pressure of that fluid that is transmitted by the stapes bone through that one eighteenth size window. The fluid moves based on the frequency of the sound that we hear. 
The high tones, you see the 8,000 hertz, those are heard early on. The lower tones are much deeper into the cochlea. Your wife's voice, my wife's voice, is deeper in the cochlea, and that's why it's harder for me to hear. Right? It's <clears throat> that was the excuse I used for a while. She didn't buy it. I don't want to lose your attention already into the technical details about this. I couldn't really find a good diagram about the next point that I have here, but each of these microscopic hairs that are inside the cochlea are attached to a nerve. Each one has its own nerve. Thousands of nerve cells attached to thousands of microscopic hairs, and they all come together in one bundle to transmit sound through the auditory nerve into your brain. And then your brain takes that nerve information and it translates it into sound. So you can differentiate the tones, the volume, the pitch, the levels, and a voice compared to a bird, compared to a lawnmower, which is what I can't get past right now with this. But as you were created, that's all right there, and it happens instantaneously. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's the way we are created. Look at the cross section again, one more time of the whole ear. Take a look at that real quick again. Notice that all of the organs of the inner ear are protected inside of a bony cavity. Now this, God didn't just drill a hole in your skull and stick the organs inside your brain. Bone formed a cavity around these organs. As you were growing in your mother's womb, this formed to protect and guide sound. Bone grew differently, not just a flat plate of your skull. Amazing how we're designed, isn't it? Each and every part of this system is complex in the way that it works together so that we can hear sound. We often take this whole system for granted until it doesn't work like it should, right? In my case, it was a sudden one day wake up and there's no noise. Many of us have experienced the loss of sound over time because of our exposure to different noise levels or different things that happen. The nerves and the hair cells inside the cochlea tend to stop moving in the fluid. That's a hearing loss that's progressive, sensoroneuro hearing loss. Something attacked, in my case, the inner ear called the labyrinth where all those organs are together and it shut it all down. There is no more sensation of that fluid moving back and forth. They've tested and shown, nope, it all just sits there. It's pretty amazing when you consider how energy is translated in sound waves in the air into nerve signals, and then your brain says this is what it means and stands for. The auditory nerve on the right side is still connected to all of those hairs. It still is expecting to get information, so that's why it rings. Some of you have tinnitus, you understand what I'm talking about, because you're not hearing well, your nerves expect to hear something they look for sound, and that ringing is what's happening when your nerves are waiting for information to be translated to them. If we look again at the cross section, just the cochlea, <clears throat> this is the wire lead that's fed into a cochlear recipient's ear. So they take a little wire and they fix it all the way inside the cochlea so that each of those points along that feed, there's different electrical outlets. So I get shocked, basically, in order to hear now. It's not sound waves, it's electrical impulses being sent into the cochlea to make the nerves 
respond again. Isn't that amazing? The idea that God gave somebody to say, let's try this, and it works. The electrical impulses have different tones inside the cochlea, so that's what the different places are as they translate the tones and the hertz and the frequencies. But my brain now has to translate information that's a little bit different that it's receiving on the right side, an electrical impulse rather than a sound pressure. So what's this all mean, really, and how does it actually relate? I don't want this to be disjointed. How does this have anything to do with our statement of faith regarding the sanctity of life? <clears throat> Understand that the intricacy of your ear, your ability to hear, did not happen on its own. That did not develop all by itself. Your cells did not decide that it would be in their best interest to develop in such a way to transmit sound waves into impulses that could be translated by nerves as sound. I don't care how many millions of years they want to claim that this took to evolve. I will give you trillions of years to do it. And the DNA information that's stored in each of those cells to develop just like it is, where it is, how it is, and function like it is, will never grow on its own. The information that's in the DNA does not develop on its own. You can ask a scientist, and they will say, no, it doesn't. Don't go beyond that in the argument yet. What does that mean? That means it was not an accident that all of these cells developed exactly how they developed and where they developed. That cochlea that's grown right there inside your ear, it grows where it's supposed to be. You will not have a cochlea inside your nose to assist with Hearing better. The retina from your eye will never grow in place of your tympanic nerve or the, the tympanic membrane, your eardrum. Your retina grows in your eye. The eardrum grows in your ear. That's information stored in your DNA <clears throat> to make it happen exactly as it's supposed to. Imagine this is just the hearing organs. Like I said, you can take any part of human anatomy and spend time learning about it in such a complex system that makes up our human body and you will be astonished. What I want you to see is that you were designed this way. It was a purpose that God intricately created you exactly as you are. Psalm 139, turn and look at that with me, starting at verse 13. We'll read all three of those verses. <coughs> Psalm 139, verse 13, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unshaped substance, and in your book all of them were written the days which were formed for me when as yet there was not one of them. Let's pray and then we'll take a closer, deeper look at what God's word has to say about this. Oh God, I praise you. Praise must come to you. And to render it is my noblest exercise. This is your due from all your creatures, for all of your works display your attributes and fulfill your designs. 
the sea, the dry land, the winter cold, the summer heat, the morning light, the evening shade are full of you, and you give them to me richly to enjoy. You are king of kings and lord of lords. At your pleasure, empires rise and fall. All of your works praise you and your saints bless you. Let me be numbered with your holy ones. Resemble them in character and condition. Sit with them at Jesus' feet. May my religion be always firmly rooted in your word my understanding divinely informed, my affections holy and heavenly, my motives simple and pure, and my heart never wrong with you. Until I finish my course with joy, may I pursue it with diligence. In every part display the resources of the Christian and adorn the doctrine of you, my God, in all things. To the praise of your glorious grace, I pray. Amen. I want to break down the statement of faith and explain a little bit about how we came to the wording that we're using as well as the reasons behind each of the pieces included in the statement. And this may seem like it's different than what we just talked about, the two other parts, but it all does fit together. <clears throat> we already have... In our statement of faith, the section that's labeled the man, it's under section four. Under this section, we had paragraphs that discussed our belief and affirmation of Scripture regarding creation and the fall of total depravity and the need for new birth. What we realized was missing from this area, but very present in Scripture, is the idea that God designed and created man with a distinct and meaningful purpose. You are not a mistake. You have been designed by the Creator God for His purpose. <clears throat> Paul's been directing the Philippians to fix their gaze upon God and his purpose for their lives. Because of the fall, our sinful nature desires to focus on ourselves. And the problem becomes when I turn my gaze inward, then pretty soon anything I think or feel becomes the thing I pursue. We mentioned Paul's warning to the Romans. If we turn back and look at that, Romans chapter 1, we're going to read verses 18 through 25 together. <clears throat> Romans 1, 18. Oh, I can hear pages turning. That's an improvement. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident where? Within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give Thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God 
for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 18, it says, men suppress the truth of God. Verse 19 makes it clear that what is known about God, the fact that there is a God, that he is the creator and designer of all things is evident within us. Can you imagine if they had seen a cross section of an ear like I just showed you? How do you not see God there? That's the theme of our mother-daughter banquet. How can you not see God? Just look at nature. Look at creation. Look at how he's designed everything. Verse 20 tells us that God's attributes, his power, his nature can be clearly seen in the things that he has made. And then verse 21 tells us why man started to deny God. Because they didn't want to glorify him and they didn't want to give thanks for his creation. That was the beginning of the whole downward spiral. They suppressed the truth that they owed God a debt of gratitude and glory because of his creation. This downward spiral went from refusing to give God glory and thanks to refusing to even acknowledge that there is a God, to eventually setting themselves up as the divine. God allowed man to become foolish and futile in his thinking. The more man has moved away from God, the farther God has allowed man to go. Until now, our foolish, sin-darkened hearts believe that we, the created objects, can somehow be the ultimate and final source of knowledge about how we are to live. If we jump back to Psalm 139, we take a look at David's affirmation and praise. In verse 17, if we drop down there, we will see the answer to the problem that Paul presents in Romans. David says, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! What is David doing? He's giving God glory and praise and thanks for his creation. He's acknowledging God's thoughts are the highest thoughts. Because he is the divine. That's the reason that the paragraph of our statement of faith is worded the way that it is. If you turn with me now to Genesis, we're going to read together where this all started. I promise we will be less than five years looking at Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to read verses 26 through 31. That is on the screen as well. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has the fruit of the tree yielding seed. It shall be food to you, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was So, 
Verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The first point that I want to look at is that we believe God created man. 126a, it says, God said, let us make man. Then it's repeated in verse 127, or chapter 1, verse 27. It says, and God created man. We see and understand in these verses that God had a plan, that he took counsel of the Godhead regarding that plan, and then he implemented that plan to produce a creature from his own design that he called man. The design of God. What we see when we look at each other came from Almighty Creator God's own thought process. That is amazing all by itself. Amen? According to Romans, we should look at each other and give God praise and glory because of his creation. Not just looking at a diagram of my inner ear and saying, wow, but looking at you and saying, wow, you are God's design and it's incredible. Praise God for how he designed us. That's the beginning of our error, is when we don't do that. The second point that I want to look at from our statement of faith is that God created man, male and female. Genesis 1.27b, it says, male and female, he created them. It's clear from Scripture that God intentionally created man as both men and women. It's by his design that we have our distinct forms and frames and that we're made the way that we are. God programmed into us our biology and our physiology, and it's echoed in all of creation the same way. The whole idea of complementarianism. Now that's a great study if you want to spend the time to get into what that means. There's a great uh, idea behind complementarianism that helps defend our belief. That by divine intention, we have been created as male and female because we've been given the roles throughout creation. It's echoed everywhere in the plant and animal kingdom. Complementarianism is seen in all of creation. So what's the purpose behind this? Again, so that we give praise and glory to the Creator for His creation. It's by God's own design that we're able to look at males and think God designed that amazing structure just like it is. And we look at females and we think God's own thoughts went into this incredible creation. Rather than take for granted our manhood or our womanhood, we glorify God in the idea that each and every one of us is made in the design of the supremely intelligent creator of the universe, and he put it on display in human flesh. There is no accident or mistake in God's original design. When we look at all of creation, we see that God loves diversity. There are more colors in flowers, in the fall leaves, in the sunrises, or the sunsets than any of us can even fathom, especially since I'm a male. Male only see four colors, right? Isn't that right, ladies? Red, yellow, green, blue. Beyond that, I don't know fuchsia, 
mauve and all those other things that are out there. It's red, yellow, green, and blue. But God has this whole range of colors for us to see, and he loves diversity. So even though he created us originally as male and female, he then made each male and female diverse and different. Praise God for his creativity in that. The distinct beauty, the distinct function, and the details that are displayed in the unique frames and the biology and the physiology of both males and females should cause us to praise God. That is, if our gaze is fixed upon him where it should be. You see why Paul is warning the Philippians and how this is all fitting together there? It brings us to our next point. Verse 3, it says, God created man, male and female, in his own image. Verse 126, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And it's repeated in 27. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Male and female are both images of of God. But what does this mean to us? There are many deep thinkers and philosophers who spent their lives devoted to explaining what this actually means to be an image bearer of God. It's well worth our time to look deeper into what it means for us to be God's image bearers. But for the sake of time today, I want to give the simplest definition and then we'll grow out of it from there. The most basic idea behind being an image bearer is that we are made to image. How's that? Pretty simple. We have paintings and statues of people that are made and put on display so that when we look at those images, we think about or we remember that person whose image is on the statue or in the painting. That's the basic idea of being an image bearer. When we see the image, we call to mind the original. It doesn't mean that that painting or statue is the original. It just bears the image and it brings to mind that original image. The qualities, the characteristics, or nature of the original is brought to our mind when we view the image. God created us in his image so that we would reflect him, to image him to everyone else around us. You see why Paul warned the Romans that that downward spiral begins with looking at a person and refusing to give God glory and praise. That's why we're created in his image, to point to God. Give him praise for his creation. We're made in God's image to send a message about him. How great he is, because look at what he created, how amazing he is, how complex are his thoughts, how well thought out is his creation. It's amazing when you spend time looking at creation. We are here to direct attention to God. It's not about us. Like Paul has been telling the Philippians, look at where my gaze is. My gaze is upward. It's on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Fix your eyes in that same place. Our purpose as image bearers is to communicate God 
to others and help them see him in his creation. John Piper shared an incredible picture. It kind of helps illustrate what he's talking about. John Piper, he says, I was created like a mirror, an image bearer, right? A mirror that's supposed to be 45 degrees angled with the clear reflective side pointing upward so that as God shines on that mirror at that 45 degree angle, it bounces off, makes the 90 degree turn and is reflected out into the world. That's an image bearer. My gaze is fixed upward. I'm reflecting God to you. At the fall, Satan persuaded me that my image is more beautiful than God's image. So I flipped the mirror over. Now the black back side is towards God. It doesn't reflect anything. My gaze instead now is cast at the ground and the mirror casts a shadow in the shape of itself on the ground and I've fallen in love with the shadow. This is what happens. We've been loving ourselves ever since. That's what happened at the fall. At salvation, we recognize our sin, our failure, and God turns us back to our original inclination of pointing to Him, of reflecting Him. And the Holy Spirit works to clean up the mirror so that we better and better reflect the true image of Christ. And that really leads us into the next point, verse or number four. God declared his unfallen image bearers to be very good. Chapter 1, verse 31 of Genesis, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. This means that God's original design, the way that he envisioned and created all of creation, was exactly how he wanted it to be. Man in his image, male and female. Creation was spoken into existence from the mind of God. And before sin, it was just like he wanted it to be. That means that man made in his image as male and female were perfectly purposed as they were created to accomplish the plan that God designed them for. The unique form and function of every person was set to do God's work. Each has a distinct role and purpose. Each was designed to accomplish that purpose in the way that God designed and desired for us to do through his design. There were no mistakes. Everything was as it should be. Adam and Eve were able to look at each other and say, God is amazing. Look at his creation. Praise God for his work for his purpose, for the plan that he's given us to accomplish as his image bears on earth. And then Satan redirected our attention. Adam and Eve turned their gaze and attention away from God for his purpose. And man's eyes have been fixed on himself ever since the fall. We only see our own image. We recognize that it isn't a shadow. We believe this is the ultimate form and we worship a shadow that's cast on the ground. We call God's creation a mistake rather than recognize him or turn back 
our gaze to glorify Him. We try to fix the mistakes that we see in the shadows instead of redirecting our gaze, which would allow God to show us our true purpose. We affirm that God's original purpose of man, both male and female, bearing his image to glorify him in creation is what was very good. Look back at Psalm 139 again, if you will. Verse 13, we'll start there. It says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. God made you as you are for a purpose according to his plan. You are not a mistake. Turn your gaze away from yourself and fix it back upon your creator because he's the only one that can truly guide you to your purpose. Our focus is the problem, not our bodies. Listen to what J.I. Packer had to say. He's actually quoting from here Richard Baxter. Richard Baxter was an English theologian in the late 1600s. Wow, I almost got that out. J.I. Packer says, the importance of clarity about what lies at the end of the Christian pilgrimage seemed to Richard Baxter to be incalculable. The more strongly one desires the end, the more carefully and diligently one will use the means to it. The love of the end is the poise and the spring which setteth every wheel a-going. Love old English. The poise, the love of the end. Paul says, my gaze is fixed on the prize. That's what Baxter's saying. The love of the end is the poise and the spring which setteth every wheel a-going. You love that? An unknown end will not be loved. It is, an un, it is a known end and not merely an unknown God and happiness that the soul doth joyfully desire. Such desire will then give wings to the soul. It is the heavenly Christian that is the lively Christian. It is strangeness to heaven that makes us so dull. It's the end that quickens to all the means. And the more frequently and clearly this end is beheld, the more vigorous will be our motion. We run so slowly and strive so lazily because we so little mind the prize. Do you hear what Baxter is saying? It's exactly what Paul said to the Philippians. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, Forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Fix your gaze on that prize and strive for that. And the shadows don't seem like such mistakes. You're not a mistake. You are not a mistake. Your focus is lift your gaze. Look upward. Fix your gaze on God. And when we correct our focus, we see more clearly what our purpose is. 
And that brings us to the last point that I'm going to bring up today about our statement of faith. Number five says, we affirm that life itself is a gift from God. Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then Yahweh God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and so the man became a living being. All of the rest of creation, as you read the account, was spoken into existence. God said, and it was. He spoke, and it became. We see it over and over throughout the creation account. Now in chapter 2, we get down into the details just a little bit deeper. We see God not just speaking man into existence, but touching the dirt. Forming man from the dust and breathing life into him. God's breath flows into and brings life to his created image bearers. Life itself is precious. It is our duty as God's image bears to treat life as a precious gift from God. We protect life. We treat it as the most precious gift that God meant it to be. We affirm that every person, no matter how young or how old, is an image bearer of God who's been given the same gift of life that we have. The problem, again, is our focus. When we believe that this life is all that we have and this life could have been formed as a mistake, it is no longer precious to us. Life can be ended in the womb for our convenience. We look at the elderly and we say they've already served their purpose. We should get rid of them to make room and free up resources for the rest of us. Have you not heard that argument yet? You will. It's there. We protect life because it's precious. The other issues that will come up are infirmities and deformities. Ending life in the womb is a convenience. It's inconvenient for that mother to continue bearing that life. Ending life of the elderly is a convenience because they're taking up space. But what about the infirm or the deformed? All of a sudden, when we don't see life as precious anymore, we see them as a barrier to truly living, and we think that they should be removed as well. That's the whole end of this downward spiral in thinking. If life is not precious, our focus must be turned away from where we realize that we are not created just for this short, difficult-filled life. God created us for much more than this life. Think about the picture of eternity that John was granted in Revelation chapter 22. He said, we will be before the throne of God. We will see him face to face. We will serve him. Him and we will reign forever and ever. That sounds like so much more than anything I could ever strive for here on this earth. Serving God and reigning face to face with Him. That's our end goal. That's the prize that we're pursuing. This life is just a practice run. God didn't create us just for this existence. We're created for eternity. Marshall Shelley wrote about the life and death of one of his children. He said, I was with my son for his entire life. He was born at 8.20, November 22nd, 1991, and he departed, the doctor said, at 8.22. He says, why did God create a child 
to live for two minutes? You know what the answer is? He didn't. He didn't create a child to live for two minutes. God created my son, Shelley said, for eternity. He created each of us for eternity where we may be surprised to find that our true calling was always seemed just out of reach here on earth. Think about that phrase, our true calling. We could say what I was truly created for. It's the idea that we have a calling in this life, but in the next life, in eternity, we have a true calling. When we see God face to face, not just as image bearers here on earth. Think about the implication that that has for us. I was created for God's purpose in this life, but in the life to come, I will find out what my true calling is, what my true purpose is for eternity. Don't miss that life has a purpose. It has a calling for this time, but this isn't the end of my purpose. It's the beginning. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says, warn them to store up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. You see, my life here is to be spent pursuing the purpose of God so that I lay up treasures as a foundation for the next life, which is called my true life. Life here is a gift from God. Nothing about life is to be taken for granted or discounted. It's by God's design. It's by his purpose. And it's only building towards my true life that will be lived in his presence for eternity. We can see the rest of the statement of faith and affirmation that God's original design of mankind as his image bearers within both genders have distinct and meaningful purposes. We have roles to play within God's plan. I will never discount the role that you play. That role, your purpose, and your plan are designed by Almighty Creator God. You should never discount the role that you play. And we will never discount the age, the gender, the ethnicity, the economic status or cultural characteristics of any person. God made you as you are for his distinct purpose and his plan. My ear did not happen by chance. This was not a mistake. You did not happen by chance. You are not a mistake. Agree with the psalmist that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Agree with Romans when you look at yourself and then look at the rest of creation and you turn and glorify God and say, praise you for your creation. Serve God and reign as his ambassadors and image bearers now in preparation for eternity when you will serve and reign in perfection face to face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb. And the fact that you formed me wonderfully and with intentionality is why I praise you. My soul knows how wonderful you are. Nothing was hidden from you when you created me in the depths of the earth. You saw me. You see me. And you wrote out my days and they are fully written in every detail. Your thoughts overwhelm me and I love them as I am unable to comprehend the amount or significance. You are just and your will will be done. 
Let me keep my gaze fixed upon you and submit to your purpose for your glory in all my life. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.